Major announcements. We will have a collection plate outside when, when you guys leave. Uh, that'll go directly to headquarters. So uh, if you'd like to throw in a few dollars, uh, that'd be great. Um, and then there's, a, there's other ways to give online if you're interested. But uh, we usually do this during fellowship nights is, is leave a collection plate outside just uh, once every uh, like three or four times a year, uh, three or four times a semester. So um, other than that, let's pray. We'll get started. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, this time that we have together to study your word. We thank you for uh, these men that have gone before us, uh, Elijah, Elisha, and uh, the lessons that we can learn from their lives and uh, the pages of scripture that you've given us. And as we look at those tonight, uh, I pray that you would uh, change our hearts, make us more like your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, for those that you're wondering how Caleb ran at state this past weekend, we'll just say... He finished. <laughs> now, there are a few jokes in cross country that have to do with the course. Uh, the first is this. If you don't know the course well enough, just follow the runner in front of you. Uh, but you see, if you're in the lead, then that doesn't always work. So uh, normally, if you're in the lead, you're probably already familiar with the course. Uh, but for some reason, you're not. And it, it's a lot like a road race. They have a, a lead vehicle. Only in cross country, it's a lead ATV. It's usually a, some sort of gator. Uh, and then in most races, they have a lead gator, and then they have a rear gator uh, to follow the last runner on the course to make sure uh, that everybody finishes. And so the other joke is this. If you hear the gator behind you, speed up, because you don't want to be the last runner. Let me tell you, there were several meets this year that a Truman runner was in front of that rear gator. Um, the irony of our season was that we were either last place or second to last as a team at almost every meet, and yet we still ended up taking two runners to state. And for Truman, that's pretty good because we may very well be uh, the only two athletes that will go to state in any sport this year at that school. Um, I said all that to say that Caleb ran his heart out at the district meet to, to get to the state meet. And I, he was nursing an injury, and he made it through really without any significant pain. He probably ran uh, the best race of his life to qualify for state. Uh, however, running at the state meet was a different story because I think within the first kilometer, um, his legs started hurting and unfortunately it continued to get worse throughout the race. Um, and by the end, Caleb had the rear gator behind him <laughs> and all the spectators in giving him the pity clap at the end, you know. Um, so within one week, uh, there were all kinds of emotions. Uh, from the highest of, of running a great race at districts and then to the next of having the gator bringing up the rear uh, right behind you. And so as I was preparing for this week's talk, uh, I was reminded once again um, of the sovereignty of God. And let me read, just read to you from the Heidelberg Catechism uh, from question number 27. Uh, the question is this, what do you understand by the providence of God? Answer, providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds as with his hand, heaven and earth, and all creatures, leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but from his fatherly hand, and so rules them that nothing is by chance. Everything comes to us by our Father's loving and wise hand. And the reason it comes to mind for me this week is because you might be experiencing a, a low point in your life right now. Maybe not. Maybe these things are going very well for you. Uh, maybe you're anxious about something. Uh, maybe you have your hope set on tomorrow's election results. Uh, yeah. I don't know. But whatever it is, understand this. God is on his throne. Amen. And nothing can change that. Uh, the truth is, and we need to continue to remember that God is sovereign. Uh, he is giving life to nature. He is still giving life to every one of us in this room. He is on his throne. And that, in at least in that part, it is the message tonight. Uh, so if you would, 2 Kings chapter 2, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Uh, 2 Kings 2. Uh, yes, God is still on his throne as he was some 2,800 years ago, and he still is today. In our passage, we see that Elisha knew uh, most likely where Elijah was going. He was going to visit the school of the prophets, but ultimately Elijah was going to a place where he would be taken out of this world. Um, Elisha would not, he could not miss that event. And the opening verse of this week's passage says this, 
When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And so it appears that these two men knew what was going to happen. Uh, maybe God had revealed it to Elijah, and this was some kind of final test uh, for Elisha to see if he was ready for ministry. Could have been a final training session uh, for Elisha, where he would gain strength for the work that was ahead of him. Either way, Elisha would be by Elijah's side, literally, until the very end. Uh, remember, these were challenging and uncertain days in the time of Israel and Judah. Uh, the people of Israel had forsaken God and his word. They had come to, to worship Baal. Uh, wicked rulers reigned. Spiritual darkness dominated the scene. All the while, Elisha was about to lose his cherished mentor and friend. Now, Elijah was known at the time as the greatest of all prophets. And Elisha was recognized as his apparent successor. And so in this time of transition... These men are no doubt anxious about the spiritual state of Israel. And they're going to lose a great leader who had spoken and acted with great authority and grace. But the question on everyone's mind was, would Elisha measure up? Most scholars estimate that Elisha spent six years uh, under Elijah's understudy. And during this time, they developed the classic mentor-mentee relationship. Elisha even referred to his predecessor as his father. Now, God's purpose for Elisha certainly required a single-minded commitment and focus. Now, one other thing to remember is that Elisha had formerly been a very successful farmer. You might remember that. One day, he's, he's working in his fields. Elijah comes along, puts his cloak around his shoulders, and incredibly, without discussion or argument, he left it all behind to follow Elijah and become God's prophet. He burned his plows, slaughtered his oxen, said goodbye to his family. If you think about it, Elisha had sacrificed a lot to follow after Elijah. And so now he's going to lose the security of his mentor's guidance and courage. They've been together a long time. And Elisha knew that from that point on, he'd be walking alone. However, he was taking this convoluted route as they're moving from place to place uh, during this final departure. And they're visiting these schools of prophets in, in the region. Those were groups of men who seemed to follow Elijah and follow after God. And so God sent them to these schools, and Elijah explained to them that his mission was not quite yet finished. Now, these men also seemed to know that Elijah's time was going to an end as well. And so back to the question that was on everyone's mind. Would Elisha measure up? Was he ready for the challenge? Did he have what it takes? And so Elijah pauses this journey three times to ask Elijah to stay behind. Gilgal to Bethel, on to Jericho, and then to the Jordan River. Three times he tests Elisha. And three times, Elisha refuses to quit. He's testing Elijah's commitment by giving him the option to stay behind, to walk away from this difficult life ahead. And through their emotional state and this deliberate journey, we see Elisha's commitment to his mentor. But more importantly, his commitment to Elijah's God. I believe this demonstrated several things about his character. He's got a teachable spirit. He's got loyalty. He has a commitment to God's calling to the very end. The BSF notes say this, Elisha depended on God with an unwavering focus and waited on his timing. Even the Jordan River was an issue with these men of God as they find their final obstacle. Verse 8 tells us, Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, struck at the water with it, and the water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry land. Uh, you couldn't help but notice the similarity here with, with Joshua and with Moses both. Moses crossed the Red Sea when he stretched out his staff over the water walked over, leading Israel out of Egypt. And then when Joshua was leading Israel into the Promised Land during the Jordan's flood stage, they crossed over on dry land as well. Here, Elijah parts the river in a similar fashion, indicating they have the same Spirit of God as both Moses and Joshua. Of course, later, when Elisha does the same thing on his way back, it showed, too, that he was God's prophet. Now, on the other side, knowing that time was near, Elijah asked Elisha what he would like from him. The answer? Verse 9, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, on first read, that seems a little inappropriate. It might even seem selfish. It seems like Elisha maybe wanted to be more powerful or even twice as powerful as his predecessor. But I think the fact of that is, is just the opposite. I think it indicates Elisha's sense of inadequacy. I believe he recognized he was so ill-equipped to be Elijah's successor, that he needed twice the spirit. Elisha knew he was entering God's work and that only God could do the work. And he needed the Holy Spirit to have, to have the courage, to have the resolve, to have the power to accomplish God's will. 
Now the answer came in verse 10, knowing he's just an instrument and that God was in control, Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, meaning that's not mine to give. Only God can grant that. It could also mean something like, that which you've requested, that which you've asked, will mean a very hard life for you, a life filled with trials and persecutions. Whatever the case, uh, a condition was attached. If he witnessed the event, he would be the successor. So evidently, while they were in deep conversation, Elisha, uh, being taught by Elijah, these chariots appeared. Verse 11 describes it as a chariot of fire and horses of fire. It was a departure as spectacular as his life. He'd been called a prophet of fire. He'd even called down fire from heaven when he challenged the prophets of Baal, right? And so maybe this was a final testimony to his ministry. Elijah's name means the Lord is God. Yahweh is God. And this was a very proclamation of that truth. This wasn't Baal, whose name meant Lord. Lord with a little l, right? Not only was Baal a little l lord, he was also called the rider of the clouds. He was known as the storm god and sent wind and rain, lightning and fire is what he was supposed to be known for. And so it seems with this whirlwind of fire showed that the Lord God alone is the true ruler of the sky and earth. He is the one that rides upon the clouds. He is the one that rules the earth, not Baal. Elijah was gone now, but Elijah and the God of Elijah was still at work on earth equipping his new man. So what do we learn from this episode of transition, this transition of one power to the next? What's the principle we can take home? I think the principle is this. God equips his people in order to complete his work and his will. God equips his people in order to complete his work and his will. February 18th, 1546, not having the physical energy to return to Wittenberg, Martin Luther died in Eisenbrain. Uh, this is the same town he had been born in 62 years before. He'd gone there to settle a dispute between uh, the Mansfield Counts, but negotiations had ended unsuccessfully. And on his deathbed, he prayed, Into your hands I command my spirit. You have saved me, Father, you faithful God. When the message of his death made it to Wittenberg, a messenger interrupted Philip Marinkoff's lecture with the news, and in shock, the professor cried, Alas, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereof. You see, the, the church had lost its Elijah, but that didn't mean that the church or the Reformation was dead, because God continues to raise up men and gift them to do his work, and by faith that work is done and God is pleased. Those who carry on God's work and God's will do so really for only a short time, and then they're gone. And the faithful are left behind, sometimes wondering, what now? And I think of, of men who have gone before, men who, like, like my dad, who taught a Sunday school class for maybe only 10 years. But what about men who have literally changed the world through a lifetime of preaching? How will the world hear the gospel? Men and women will be called to be faithful and must respond. God's voice will not be silenced. God raises up the right people at the right time to speak for him and lead in his cause the right way. So how willing are you to step up and lead when God calls? Who has God raised up to lead you forward? Wise leaders recognize the responsibility and privilege of their call. They also recognize their total dependence on God. And so what areas of, of your life has God placed you in areas of influence? And how are you responding? Does that responsibility overwhelm you? Well, you know what? God supplies what his call demands. Elisha stepped up and God provided. God is generous and he loves to give what cannot be earned. And we see that in the rest of our passage as we finish up with this second part with Elisha taking over the ministry. We return to our narrative in verse 19 of chapter 2. And the people complain about their water and their land. And Most likely this is the city of Jericho. Uh, spiritually speaking, Jericho had become just like its land and water. They were useless, they were unproductive, but just like God was able to heal their land through this use of really strange things, he can heal the dead and sinful heart. Uh, verse 23 tells us that Elisha then moved on to Bethel, but unlike Jericho, the people there 
Uh, they weren't interested in turning to God. They weren't interested in l listening to his prophets. Instead, they loved their false gods and their empty religion. And this last part of chapter 2 indicates uh, that some of these people that were in the area, they laughed at God's prophet. Now, you might have thought that this response by Elijah was maybe a little over the top. Uh, it's one of those Old Testament passages that we really have some questions about. Uh, is this the nature of God? To possibly execute children for making someone fun of someone with a receding hairline? Um, you see, it's though it's, it's, it's much worse than that. God had already sent a prophet who predicted a curse against this place, and the kings of Israel never stopped their sin of idolatry. The people of Bethel loved their false gods, and they laughed at God's prophet. But these youths in Bethel were doing something especially wicked. Uh, they were not merely insulting Elijah, they were cursing God himself. Uh, they were uh, they were telling him to, to go up. You might remember that. Go up. Uh, they were laughing at the way Elijah went up to heaven. But it was God who took Elijah, remember? And, and so in essence, these, these kids were mocking God himself in the way that he took Elijah. In addition, they made fun of his baldness. Uh, to put it into context, the priests of that day of these false religion, uh, they were also bald because they shaved their heads. And so that when the children said that, they were saying there, he was really no better than the priests of the false religion. And so the, the real meaning of their insults may have been something like, well, go up to heaven if you can, otherwise go and worship our idols because they're no different than yours. We should note that children left to themselves, undisciplined, do some of the vilest things. Uh, in a sermon over this very text, Jonathan Edwards said this about children. He says, persons are guilty of a great deal of sin when they are children. Their hearts are naturally full of sin. They don't naturally incline to God. They have no love to God by nature. They have no delight in religion. They hate God's ways. They hate Sabbath and prayer. They don't wholly mind what God says to them. They are naturally senseless, proud, full of malice and hatred, inclined to wicked thoughts, and have nothing good in them. He then quotes Psalm 58, 3. Even from birth the wicked go astray. From the womb they are wayward and speak lies. It's just a very good reminder we need to be training the next generation because children, too, need to be regenerated. And sometimes it's a hard lesson for people to understand the seriousness of sin. Of course, the action here was serious. It was very serious. And as harsh as it seemed, it was designed for us to understand the importance of the issue. Also, when Elisha responds, he's not just defending his own honor. He's defending the Lord's name on God's behalf. It was God who acted here, not Elisha. Now, most of Elisha's miracles were going to be blessings in, in the future. But this was a strong warning early on in his ministry. If this nation persisted in rebelling against God, it was headed for disaster. And although this was similar to the actions on Mount Carmel, we will see in the upcoming weeks that Elijah was not Elisha. Uh, he was, uh, Elisha was, was God's unique man. He was not just a copy or, or a shadow of his predecessor. And so as we get into chapter 3, we kind of resume our narrative from, from last week with, uh, after Ahab was killed in battle. And it's his son Joram, or also known as Jehoram. I think they, the NIV calls him Joram, just not confuse him with Jehoshaphat's other sons. And so um, Joram becomes king and continues in this evil idolatry of his parents. And the first crisis he faces is the Moabites. Um, they were really, they were tired of paying these absorbent taxes to, to Israel. And so what better time to rebel than during this time of transition? And this brings us once again to our man, Fat Fat Jehoshaphat. And so we're backtracking a little bit this week. And so Joram forms this three, three-way military alliance with, with King Jehoshaphat and also the king of Edom. And he puts the Moabites, he's, he's going to want to put them back in their place. And so we looked at Jehoshaphat's mistake last week when he formed that coalition with Ahab. And this was really no different because once again, Jehoshaphat doesn't seek God's direction, doesn't seek his counsel uh, before doing this. Uh, but Joram somehow convinced him. And you see, I think Joram knew that Jehoshaphat had a relationship with God. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat. And, and there was some quality uh, about Joram in that he wasn't as bad as his parents. He must have understood at some level right and wrong. Uh, in verse 2, it says, he got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. So I think he understands at some level that God is God and that idols are useless. But being the son of Jeb, Jezebel and Ahab, he's got a long way to go, right? Yeah. 
Also, verse 3 says, nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam. Let's also remember that we may not view our sins to be as bad as other sins, but we need to understand that sin is sin in whatever form it is. I think also he's using Jehoshaphat as kind of a way to use God's help without really seeking God. Jehoshaphat is a godly king for the most part. And so if he can get him to join this alliance, then you know they'll have the, the big guy in the back pocket, right? And so the alliance is formed. They come up with this great plan. We'll, we'll sneak in from behind. And the only problem is after a week, they ran out of water, right? Now, not seeking God in the first place was their first problem. But as soon as they get into trouble, another issue arises. Joram blames God for the trouble that he got himself in. Verse 10, has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? Now, this is only going to make things worse. And I think Jehoshaphat knows that. Uh, because very much like last week, Jehoshaphat has enough sense at least to seek God's prophet, even if it's a little late. Jehoshaphat may have made many mistakes, but he still remembered his God, and he still trusted his God. Jehoshaphat still knew and believed that his God is kind, and he is pleased to help his people, and he wants to forgive. And, and so these three kings go to see Elisha, and by that simple action, I, I think it shows that they'd humbled themselves. And when they approached him, Elisha made it clear that he did not approve of the king of Israel. His parents had introduced false gods to their nation, and the king himself was promoting false religion. So it wouldn't be until the king recognized and understood that only the Lord, the real God, could help him now. Of course, the other reason for Elisha's support was Jehoshaphat himself, because he was still a true worshiper, even though he veered off course a little bit, right? And so the miracle was accomplished with the power of God in providing water, and along with the obedience of the soldiers who attacked the enemy. And then the final part of that story with the, the Moabite king sacrificing his son as like a last-ditch effort. It's a strange ending to this chapter for sure. One thing we can see from these events, Elisha has now been authenticated as God's prophet. But on the other hand, it was God who was the one doing the work. And so what can we take home from, from this second part? I think the principle here is this. Recognizing God's sovereignty allows his people to see his superiority. Recognizing God's sovereignty allows his people to see his superiority. When God sovereignly works, it's he who does the work. What did Elisha say earlier in the text? This is an easy thing in the eyes of our Lord. Notice today, no one worships Baal. No one worships Chemosh, the god the Moabite king sacrificed his son to. In fact, false religions come and go because there's no power behind them. And the reason the true God of the universe will be worshipped throughout eternity is because he's worthy. He's in control, and he is the true God of the universe to be worshipped for eternity. And he's a gracious God to his people. A.W. Pink said this, There can be no progress in divine things until there is personal recognition that God is supreme, that he is to be feared and revered, and he is to be owned and served as Lord. Through both Elisha and Elijah, God offered timely warnings and amazing displays of his power. God revealed his heart, a heart that he longs for his wayward people to turn to him. He still raises people up to speak for him faithfully and boldly. God's voice cannot be silenced, not when people reject him, or even when his, message, his, his messengers change. He still sends and equips those to boldly speak for him in a world that largely rejects him. That is the grace of God. So I would encourage you once again to, to read or, or reread, if you have already, the Doctrine of Grace on page 127 in the notes. And so in what way do you sense God's relentless and gracious pursuit of your wholehearted devotion? See, God's grace is deeper, it is wider, it is bigger and stronger than our sin. So how confident and secure are you in God's generous grace towards you when you fail? What specific expression of God's grace leads you to praise Him and thank Him? Is there any sin that you need to bring to the Lord for forgiveness? Is there anyone in your life that you think is beyond God's grace? I, I think that's really the way we're going to wrap up, up tonight's 
talk. It's a, really a final summary principle about God's wonderful grace. That final principle is this. God shows himself to be gracious and merciful towards a wayward people. God shows himself to be gracious and merciful toward a wayward people. What situation are you facing that you think might be beyond, be beyond God's powerful grace? Whatever it is, He can handle it if you'll go to Him. Let's pray. Well, dear Heavenly Father, once again, we, we thank You for these men, uh, for Elijah and for Elisha, and for the example that they set of their godliness and their, their trust in You and their faith. And so as we um, look through these lessons in the, in the passage of Scripture this week as we review and as we continue on through uh, the next few chapters. I just pray that you would open up our eyes to um, hear what you have to say to us as we lead others and as we, um, as we are guided uh, through your word. I pray that we'd be obedient to you. Uh, we'd see your faithfulness and your sovereignty as something that we can trust. I uh, pray that as we continue on um, through the questions and through the notes, uh, that you would change us to make us more like your sons. In his name we pray. Amen.